1949 was a year of tension as the nations of Western Europe drew together against the Soviet threat by founding NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. They had just successfully faced down the Soviet Union's blockade of West Berlin by maintaining a year-long airlift to supply the beleaguered city. Far East, communism also seemed on the rampage, with Mao Zedong seizing power in mainland China. One bright spot for the Western powers was the defiant escape of the British frigate HMS Amethyst down the Yangtze River under communist fire. The Essex marshes along the north side of the River Thames are one of the most deserted and desolate areas of England. For centuries, they have been the haunt of smugglers and a refuge for fugitives from nearby London. On Friday, the 21st of October, a farm labourer, Sidney Tiffin, set out in his wild fowling punt for a day's shooting. Well, I hadn't been out long when I see it. And that was just the north side of Harry for. Of course, I pulled up, shoved up alongside on it and got a hold on it and cut it open. The claw opened on the wall and that sunk, that was where it... I see that was a body, man body or all. See, it was a body, soon it floated out. Then, to his horror, Mr Tiffin saw that the body was a headless torso with its arms tied behind its back. It was too heavy to get into the unstable punt so he secured it to a stake and pulled off to alert the police. They found that the unknown body was male and had been stabbed repeatedly in the chest. Within hours, the remains were being examined by Britain's leading pathologist, Dr. Francis Capps. The head had been cut off. The arms and hands were still intact. The legs had been cut off, possibly while the man was wearing his trousers because the top section of the trousers with the braces attached was still in position. He also had a shirt on it, a well-tailored shirt, with the uh, name of an East End of London shirt tailors. Superintendent Colin McDougall of Scotland Yard was put in charge of the case and inquiries started in the surrounding areas. Scotland Yard soon had its first breakthrough. Even though the hands were badly waterlogged, it proved possible to remove the skin of the fingers and take prints from them. A search of the yard's record soon revealed that the prints were those of a wealthy car dealer who had disappeared mysteriously little more than a fortnight earlier. Stanley Setti had last been seen alive on the afternoon of the 5th of October. He had been trading as usual in the second-hand car market which had grown up around Warren Street in London. At about six o'clock, he had left his usual patch and had been seen driving off in his distinctive yellow Citroen. His disappearance was reported next day by his sister Eva and her husband when the Citroen was found parked outside his garage in Cambridge Terrace Mews. His nearby flat was deserted. Iraqi-born Stanley Setti was typical of the prosperous men who had mysteriously done well out of the war, trading petrol, ration books, army surplus equipment, and anything else that could be obtained. Few questions were asked and large wads of money carried. Later, Seti's driver, Charlie Fryer, described Seti's methods. He was very well liked in Warren Street, all round. If anybody wanted to borrow a thousand pound, and he knew them, they could borrow it. With no, no questions, no, no arguments or anything. I used to go to Rovers quite regularly, pick up cars, new ones, for Pakistanis, who could get cars up that weren't on Covenant at the time, which said he was to pay for, give the Pakistani a 20 pound, I think, and then chuck him out. 
and then go and make £200 profit or £300 profit down Warren Street. In the circumstances, a revenge killing seemed possible. But detectives found out that Seti had also been carrying more than £1,000 in cash and started to keep a watch for people spending large sums. One piece of forensic evidence puzzled them. The major bones of the body were found to have been severely fractured, as if it had been crushed or dropped from a height. In austerity-strapped Britain, the large white five-pound note was still unusual enough for people to remember when they were given one. Seti's bank was able to give the police the numbers of his wad, and when these were publicized, Owen Rawlings, a taxi driver from South End, came forward. He had been given one by a man he picked up at South End Airport at about the time Seti disappeared. He had driven the man to London, dropping him in the Finchley Road. At South End Airport, the police checked all movements. There was little private flying at that time, and they soon became interested in an Oster single-engined four-seater. This had arrived on the evening of the 5th of October in somewhat dramatic circumstances, as the assistant airport manager later recalled. It was a very murky afternoon. In fact, visibility was something like a mile or possibly less. On this particular day, we're expecting a Halton aircraft to land. When this aircraft was well down his approach, out of the blue, or shall we say the murk, appears an, an Oster, which cuts right in front of the, of the Halton. Luckily, he touched down and immediately turned off the runway, thus getting out of the way of the Halton and taxi towards where we were standing outside of our club buildings. The pilot left the plane at South End for the night and returned the next day, once again making himself noticed as Chief Instructor Keats explained. He struggled out of the car with a very large parcel that was wrapped up in some brown wrapping tied up with string. I watched him struggle for a minute or two and then felt obligated to offer him my assistance. But when I approached him, he very furtively tried to say, I don't want your assistance, don't come near me. I've got some fish here, he said, and at that I walked away from him. The mysterious pilot had manhandled his package into the plane and taken off. It emerged that the Oster's flight had begun at Elstree, about 40 miles west of South End. The police became even more interested when they checked the records at Elstree and discovered that the pilot, Donald Hume, was a close associate of Stanley Setti. Rumour in Warren Street also suggested that Hume used his pilot's licence to smuggle goods to and from Europe, anything from black market whiskey to arms. All in all, the police felt that Mr Hume had some explaining to do. Early on the morning of the 27th of October, Plain clothes officers went to call on his two-floor maisonette in the Finchley Road, catching Hume still asleep. Hume was taken to Albany Street Police Station. At first, he tried to deny that he had ever hired an aircraft at Elstree. Then, realizing that the police knew everything about his recent movements, Hume suddenly broke down. Astonished police officers were confronted with a statement about how three men, named Mac, Greeny, and The Boy, had approached Hume in Warren Street and asked him if he would do a flying job for them. They would pay £150 in fivers to have three parcels dropped into the English Channel. Hume had agreed, asking no questions about the contents. Now the police had an explanation for the fractures which the body had suffered, since it would have hit the water with great force. Unimpressed with Hume's claims of innocence, the following day the police charged him with Stanley Setti's murder. They then started to search his flat in the Finchley Road. Detectives discovered that the carpet in the sitting room had been taken away for cleaning, and the boards around the edge of the room had recently been restained. Immediately, they began to make tests between the edges of the boards using chemicals which react to show minute traces of blood. A 
a distinct pattern emerged in the sitting room and through into the hall and dining room. When the boards were removed, substantial bloodstains could be seen. The carpet was traced to a nearby cleaner and found to have the remains of a bloodstain in one corner. By the time Hume appeared at Bow Street Magistrates Court on the 16th of November for committal proceedings, the police had assembled some 23 witnesses. Among them, Joe Stadham, the decorator who had restained the sitting room floor and who remembered helping Hume down from his flat with an extremely heavy parcel. Faced with this evidence, Hume claimed that the blood had seeped from the parcels brought by the three mysterious men. He had kept quiet for fear of his life. Despite their searches, the police could find no fingerprints or other evidence that said he had entered Hume's flat alive. Hume's wife, Cynthia, had been in the bedroom on the upper floor of the maisonette all evening, but heard nothing. The Hume's cleaner, who had come in the day after Seti's disappearance, had noticed that the carpet had gone for cleaning, but had not seen anything else unusual. Despite these gaps in their case, the police had no trouble in having Donald Hume committed to trial for murder. At the very least, he had admitted to being involved in covering up a vicious killing. Donald Hume had been born in Dorset in 1919. Illegitimate, he was brought up in an orphanage. Coming to London at the age of eight to live with his aunt, he felt deeply rejected when he discovered that she was really his mother. Amid the economic hardship after the Great Depression, Hume ran away at the age of 14. He wrote to his mother saying that he would never forgive her for deserting him and vowed never to see her again. For the next five years, Hume lived in London, existing on part-time jobs while training as an electrician. He joined the Communist Party and became an active member, taking part in the great street battles in London's East End with Oswald Mosley's fascist black shirts. Spanish Civil War began, Hume applied to join the International Brigade to go to fight Franco. Once again, he was deeply hurt when he was rejected as being too young. When the Second World War began, Hume joined the RAF and was accepted for air crew training. He proved an excellent pilot and rapidly gained his wings. But during a practice flight while on operational training in 1940, he was badly injured. Invalided out of the RAF, he returned to London. Amid the chaos of the Blitz, he soon built up a good little business in various rackets, including rebottling surgical spirits as gin and selling this to illegal nightclubs. business became too hot, Hume acquired an RAF pilot's officer's uniform and toured the country requisitioning equipment, which he sold on the black market. He then became bolder and began turning up at RAF officers' messes and demanding a room and food. He passed a series of dud checks and when finally caught in June 1942, was amazed only to be bound over to keep the peace for two years. Back in London, he saw the opportunities in repairing bomb damage and set himself up as an electrician. By the end of the war, he had built up a thriving business, employing some 45 men. The coming of peace brought new opportunities, most of them straight. Hume seemed to be the model of a successful young post-war businessman and developed a taste for the bright lights and high life. At a nightclub in 1947, he met Cynthia, who had served in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. 
In the same year, Hume was also befriended in the street by the other love in his life, a Mongol called Tony. Hume and Cynthia were married in 1948, but shortly afterwards, his businesses started to collapse. By the end of the year, Hume was a regular in the dubious world of Warren Street, and soon doing business with Stanley Setti, acquiring cars and dealing in forged documents and petrol coupons. Hume's trial began in the number one court of the Old Bailey on the 18th of January, 1950, before Mr. Justice Lewis. Public interest in the case was intense and a crowded courtroom heard the prosecution admit that most of its evidence would be circumstantial. It was claimed that the bloodstains in the flat and on the carpet proved that it must be Hume who had killed Seti and butchered him there. Hume's flights to dispose of the body were fully corroborated with prosecution witnesses. After the first day, the trial had to be halted when Mr. Justice Lewis was taken ill. When it restarted under Mr. Justice Sellers, Hume's statement about the three men in Warren Street was described as complete fantasy. For the defense, R.F. Levy KC did not attempt to deny that Hume had a shady past, but emphasized that that did not make him a murderer. The fact that the police had not been able to find the three men did not mean that they did not exist. Levy made much of the fact that no evidence had been produced to prove that Seti had been at the Maisonette. Cynthia Hume confirmed that she had been in all evening, listening to the radio, and had heard nothing. There was a clash over the wounds on the torso between two of the country's leading pathologists. For the prosecution, Dr. Francis Camps testified that they had probably been inflicted by one person. This was denied by Dr. Donald Tier, who stated that they were consistent with having been caused by more than one attacker. On the penultimate day of the trial, the defense created a sensation by asking for permission to call an additional witness. This was a man who described how he had been in Paris the previous year working with a gang which had been smuggling cars. He claimed to have heard two of the gang referred to as Maxi and the boy, the nicknames of two of Hume's mysterious paymasters. It was now obvious that Hume's fate would hinge on whether the jury believed that the three men had existed and that Hume had acted as their unwilling accomplice. The jury withdrew at midday on the 26th of January. Within three hours, they were back to announce that they were irretrievably split and could see no prospect of reaching a verdict. The prosecution announced that it would not seek a retrial on the murder charge, and Hume was formally found not guilty. He then pleaded guilty to being an accessory to murder. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. The Hume trial, with its tales of London lowlife, mysterious heavies and a dismembered body dropped from an aircraft, had been sensational. But it paled into insignificance when in June 1958, the Sunday pictorial printed a full confession from Donald Hume. This revealed that the police had been right in every detail and that Hume had based his description of the three men entirely on the detectives questioning him. Hume had been released with full remission in February 1958 and had toured Fleet Street until he found a taker for his story. Having made sure that his acquittal of murder would still stand, Hume collaborated fully. He revealed how he had become increasingly resentful at Seti's obvious contempt for him. His anger had reached boiling point when Seti kicked his beloved dog, Tony. A few days later, on the 4th of October, Hume arrived home from the pub to discover that Seti had let himself into his flat. 
Furious that Seti now seemed to have no respect for his privacy, Hume threatened to throw him out. When Seti laughed in his face, Hume had stabbed him with an ex-Nazi dagger he kept in a drawer. Seti had died instantly. Amazed that no one seemed to have heard, Hume cleared up the blood, hid the body, and drove Seti's car back to Cambridge Terrace Mews. Aware that the body would be too heavy to get downstairs in one piece, he dismembered it with this hacksaw. Wrapping the legs and torso as three separate parcels. The head he put in a cardboard box. Well known at Elstree, Hume had no trouble in hiring a plane and posting a flight plan to South End. But as he neared South End, he swung southwest to cross the Thames estuary and Kent and head out over the English Channel. After more than an hour of flying, he was out over deep water. Somewhere on the French side of the channel, he dropped the head, and the two parcels containing the legs, together with the dagger and the hacksaw. Having dived low to make sure they had sunk, he set off back to South End. Deteriorating weather as he approached the airport caused him to miss two warning flares, and he had almost collided with the other aircraft. The next day, he repeated the journey with Tony in the plane, taking the parcel with the torso. At roughly the same point, he dropped the package, but it burst on impact with the water. The blanket containing the weight sank, leaving the body still floating. He headed back, hoping that the body was far enough from land to disappear. Once again, the autumn weather closed in. This time, Hume was forced to land at Gravesend, where he left the aircraft to be collected by another pilot. It was only the freak of tide and wind which began to unravel what could have been an almost perfect crime. Hume's newfound freedom was to be short-lived. Disguised and using a false name, he had gone to Switzerland before his sensational confession hit the headlines. He returned to Britain to rob a bank, and then went back to Switzerland to try to repeat the trick. But he was cornered after a hold-up at this bank in Zurich in January 1959 and shot dead a taxi driver. Arrested, he was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. The Swiss returned Hume to Britain in 1976, where he was given psychiatric tests and committed to Broadmoor, where he was still imprisoned more than 15 years later. The case of the headless torso, which Sidney Tiffin found in the mudflats, remains one of the most intriguing of post-war murders. The identification of the body found on the lonely marshland and the tracking down of the murderer were triumphs of police work. And Donald Hume came so close to getting away with the crime.